Wow. It will follow what was coming. Death. Who's this? Doctor? The cough kind of sounded like him. That sets the stage nicely, doesn't it? The hell is this place? There's someone here right before him. If you think because she's dead, I'm weak, then you understand very little. Oh, this looks so good. Hey, Rachel. From last series, right? The final two episodes? Is this prison? Are there others? Is he here by himself? They've got monitors. Ominous. A shovel and some dirt. Oh my god. Whoa, that scared him. Whoa, he recognizes that thing. A person. That is so creepy. Whoa. I just got chills. Ah, is this the representation of death? It's also kind of like the Minotaur in the labyrinth. The maze. Oh, oh God, it's so narrow. It makes you claustrophobic, especially if you're being chased. But it's quite a slow paced chase, isn't it? Kind of goes back to that dialogue in the opening. I know you. Yeah. That reaction told me as much. I've seen you before. See Claire. Oh. Still got Force of habit. I'm scared. I just realized that. I'm actually scared. Whoa. Of dying. Something I said? I mean, you just I admit said. it, you're scared of dying. Okay, this is a type of prison, isn't it? I mean, the doctor was brought here by them, they, I believe them to be the Time Lords or Gallifrey or something because the, the confession dial is part of the deal, right? Oh. Murray Gold already at it. It looks to be quite old. Okay, this is personalized for the doctor. For a very long time, right? Oh. Sorry, I'm late. What? If they're gonna right, Clara. So is that like in his head? There's a storeroom in your mind. Lock the door. Storeroom. I think this is my storm. How I escape making you laugh. That's what I'm doing right now. But it's the back of Clara. I'm falling. Clara. Because that's the last time he saw her, right? The back of her. Can't wait to hear what I say. Uh. Nothing without an audience. Ah. This feels so different. I like it. I, I most definitely like it, but I wasn't quite expecting something like this. He admitted that he's afraid of dying. Clara. He's tired. Holy shit. That's gotta be thousands. More than thousands, tens of thousands. He's the only one here though, as far as I know, as of this point, because it's personalized for him, right? They brought him here. Yeah, even this kind of looks like the gears, right? Oh, oh, I thought the doctor put, I mean, the doctor clearly put those there, but Ah, uh, am I looking at a loop? The doctor's been here. I mean, it's right there. His outfit's right there. Ah, uh, replace it. Okay, it is a cycle. It is some kind of loop. Ah, uh, I do like the sound of that. Until next time, doctor. Or for the next one. Beautiful set design. Beautiful photography. Look at this. It has this really premium feel to it, doesn't it? Oh, yes. So did the past doctor from another loop put the arrows? The one that left his um, jacket and shoes in that room? Love the use of uh, shadows in this one already. Look at this, beautiful. The doctor left to his thoughts. 
Oh, yes. Oh. The photography nerd in me is just eating this up. Oh, lovely. Got ourselves a grave. Ah, earlier, there was a shovel, right? And it had dirt on it. You know, I kind of hope this is just him. I hope I, I don't see anyone else. I mean, I see that creature from his nightmares. But I hope it's just that the whole time. Another spade. There it is. Someone wants me to dig. What do you think, Claire? To you. Give me a hint. You yourself. Yes, yes, of course you will. And then at some point he he's going to Which leave it up top. Well killed you. Uh unfortunately. There's a lot of skulls down there. Wonder what they all went wrong. Ah, I'm trying to wrap my head around those skulls. Tens of thousands of... Look at this. It's as if he's digging his own grave. Oh yeah, this feels special. This feels special. Oh. Yeah, I definitely need to look up the DP on this one. So I saw someone's hand in the beginning, possibly the doctor himself. Blood in the halls, arrows pointing towards that. I am alive, I am... Hmm. Twelve. Okay, this is, is this essentially... The doctor's stuck in a loop, but he's trying to guide himself. The next iteration. It's confession. Ah, okay, yeah. It's related to the Damn confession truth. dial, isn't it? I've never told before. Oh, for anything. But I'm scared and I'm alone. I'm very, very scared. Yeah, look at this shot. This set is amazing, look at it. There's no signs of anyone else here, let alone tens of thousands of them. It's funny. The day you oh. lose someone isn't the worst. It's the, the days after. To do. It's all the days. They stay dead. He's got all the time at the moment. Oh. I think this whole place is inside a closed energy loop. Energy it's loop, okay. Recycling. Or maybe I'm in hell. That's okay. I'm not scared of hell, it's just I haven't for bad people. Uh, <laughs> kind of like purgatory, limbo. Well, I have to be here. Oh, forever. I was gonna say eternity? <laughs> you know, limbo, purgatory. It's not that technically, but those are the thoughts that I have at the moment. There are two events in everybody's life that nobody remembers. Two moments experienced by every living thing. Life and death? No one remembers anything about them. Yeah, you do not remember being born. Nobody remembers being born. And nobody remembers dying. Whose skull is that? Is that a past doctor? There's no one else here. And it is a loop, right? So, but he said every time the rooms reset. So, you know, I was thinking maybe every single iteration he's kind of able to guide himself. He is doing that though. I've seen a few moments. Is he carrying his own skull right now? Like, this is... <sighs> Chills right now. Just, just the score, Murray Gold's music. <laughs> it's a trap, Clara. A lure and a trap. It's the doctor's skull. Oh my god, are all of those his skulls? How does he get to the state, though? That he ends up dying and <laughs> turns into... That state? Because he had that thing to his head, right? The two... Game. Seven... Seven thousand years into the future, he said. No. Has that same thing happened that many times? I think something that's becoming clear at this point is that he's been stuck in this loop for a long time. Home. Of course. What else would it be? And home is the TARDIS. The TARDIS. One checks out. Away. Times harder than oh. 
So how exactly do you get through 20 that? Thick. Twenty feet thick. Whatever I do, I'll still be gone. You still won't be there. Doctor, it's time. Ooh. I'm gonna do something for us. Oh, is he chipping away? Oh. Oh. I have to do this, Claire. Oh, that's the blood in the hall. I have to be strong. It was the doctor in the beginning who pulled the lever. How could there be other prisoners? My hell. In my own personal hell. Oh god. Great makeup. Of course. There's no one else here. It's all you. Ah, uh, yeah, it's the open shot, isn't it? Oh, is this the- The room has reset. Finally, the old me. To make a new one. I mean, isn't that essentially regeneration? <laughs> wow, this is special. This is special. A Peter Capaldi special, one-hander. A bit of Clara sprinkled in as well, of course. A bit of sugar. If I didn't know better, I'd say I'd travel 12,000 12, years, years, years now. Oh my god. Still quite a bit to go if he's going to break through that. This is beautiful editing on display right now. In storytelling, directing. It's every single component of filmmaking coming together to deliver. This right here is one of the greatest scenes in Doctor Who. I love how each time I get the continuation of that story. Well over a billion years. Oh, you must think that's a hell of a long time. Two billion years. Oh. Ah! My God. I've got goosebumps. Ah, oh, yeah, it is a confession dial. Look at that. That's a great payoff. I'm happy about that. Is this it? Find somebody important. Tell them this might be back. it. I'm back. It's Gallifrey. Temple. I know what they did. The hybrid destined to conquer Gallifrey and stand in its ruins. Oh, it's me. Oh my god. But also, let's not forget me as in Maisie's character as well. Right? Did I just watch the greatest episode of Doctor Who? It's certainly one of the contenders for that. I feel like I've just been through this odyssey. Okay, so, um, yeah, how the hell do I even begin to tackle this? To begin to even dissect this episode, um, it's a monumental moment um, for the show itself because it's a monumental episode. Possibly, possibly Moffat's crowning achievement right here on display, right? Listen, it's, it's possible I might have a bit of recency bias because I am coming fresh off of this episode right now and... I am still kind of in a trance. See, the thing is, I already kind of have this feeling of sadness because I'm never going to experience that for the first time ever again. Never. And then beyond that, I'm never going to have this type of episode ever again, am I? It's, it's an interesting feeling, folks. And I'm sure many of you can relate to the feeling. And, you know, I, I said it's a monumental moment for the show. But you have to go beyond the show itself. You have to go beyond Doctor Who. This is television altogether. Right? This episode, I think, is an all-timer. For me, 
it goes into like an all-timer list of television episodes. Not not exclusive just to Doctor Who. I mean, you know, if you're speaking of Doctor Who episodes and ranking episodes, you know, I really don't think it's an overreaction at this point in time to say that this actually might be Moffat's crowning achievement. And that is saying something because the man has written some of the best, some of the best episodes. You know, I think a lot of his episodes make up most of my top 10. And essentially my first instinct as it ended, it really was of, did I just watch the greatest episode of Doctor Who? It took me, it took me there. I mean, it's an absolute masterpiece of an episode. Everything about this episode is right up my alley. And I'm sure there's hundreds and hundreds and I mean thousands of you who have the exact same feeling, the exact same reaction to this. And you know, the thing is, I did not know about this episode. Certainly not in the same boat as the Day of the Doctor in terms of all of the hype surrounding it. I knew about that episode for years. Like I said, I, you know, I've seen the posters years and years ago before I even started the show. On, on YouTube. Um, yeah, I knew all about that one. So, you know, leading up to it, um, yeah, I, I just knew, you know, it's one of those episodes. It's a special episode. But thankfully, I did not hear about this episode in the same manner as The Day of the Doctor. I just didn't. And I, I suppose it makes sense as well, right? The Day of the Doctor is the 50th anniversary. So, of course, of course, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of excitement and memories attached to that for many of you, for for the whole fan base, essentially. But I am so thankful. I am so happy that this episode kind of didn't land on my radar, right? That that there wasn't this expectation built up um, for a few months or for over a year or anything. You know, it's that, it's that special feeling. You know, it, it doesn't happen often. But once it happens, oh my god, it's one of the most exciting feelings as a fan of storytelling, just as a fan of the medium of filmmaking. You know, you're sitting there and it hits you, right? Oh my god, this is one of my favorite things. Anytime that happens to me during a film, during uh, a game, um, anime, uh, a book, a uh, television episode, it's a special feeling. I had that feeling a few times throughout this episode. I mean, there's multiple moments throughout this episode that I found myself just thinking, oh my God, this is special. Oh my God, it's that feeling that I crave so much. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, this is it, folks. This is uh, one of the all-time greats. It is so unique in its approach. Um, it's It's really quite experimental. You know, it really doesn't remind me of any other episode of the show. And I've been at it for some time now, right? I'm, I'm almost at Series 10, right at the ending stages of Series 9 now. Um, I mean, you know, of course, uh, it has quite the cliffhanger, sets it up nicely uh, for uh, the grand finale, right? The Doctor has made it back to Gallifrey. But of course, as the 11th uh, stated all that time ago, in the conclusion of the day of the Doctor... He's going to go home the long way around, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful callback. It's a great callback to have Capaldi say that, right? And my goodness, did he take the long way around. And of course, you know, sticking to the cliffhanger, you get that moment, the big revelation. The hybrid is me, right? Now, of course, you kind of have to look at it from a few different angles, right? Right? He didn't say, I'm the hybrid. He said, the hybrid is me. So, of course, a bit of tricky wordplay. Because of that, the audience, and in this case, me, immediately also thinks of Maisie's character, me. But, of course, at the end of the day, you always have to remember the doctor lies, right? And then, of course, the actual final possibility, indeed, he is this hybrid, right? So, I don't know. Let's, let's hold off till the finale Right? And let's see how it all plays out. Usually the things do tend to play out a bit differently. right? Once they do get a bit of time in the finale. Now, you know, I said it sets it up nicely. right? I mean, just, just by the nature of the thing that is at play here. The Doctor back on Gallifrey. It's crazy. 
And they've been hinting at it since, again, the day of the Doctor, right? And then, of course, in the beginning of this series as well, right? And uh, in the conclusion of the last series, right, they kind of they kind of flirted with the idea of the Doctor going back. Uh, though, of course, you know, all of us know how that turned out uh, and the reasoning behind him saying that he found it and all that. But yeah, here, he is truly back. But, you know, as I've stated on many occasions at this point, usually... Usually, out of the two-part finales, I suppose, this this kind of essentially functions as a three-parter because this is a continuation, a direct continuation of Face the Raven. But also, that being said, I, I do feel that this episode actually functions quite effectively as a standalone masterpiece. But yeah, beyond that, if you classify it as a two-part finale or a three-part finale, I don't know, you know, as as you know by now, I, I tend to kind of gravitate towards the first part of a two-part finale. Because usually the second one is a bit too bombastic for my liking. It's a bit too, I don't know, sometimes the whole grand nature of it just kind of just doesn't do it for me. Sometimes it's effective. It is, right? But I'd say there's more misses than hits as far as part two of a two-part it goes in Doctor Who. Again, this is just, uh, you know, subjective. This is my opinion. So yeah, of course, you know, based on past experiences, I'm going to go in cautiously optimistic, I suppose, into this um, final episode, into this finale. But the one thing that is a guarantee is that I am getting more Peter Capaldi. And that in itself is doing a lot of the lifting, isn't it? You know, that it's a treat. It's an absolute treat. Anytime I get to see this man on my screen, doing his thing it's just it's special at this point it, it truly feels special so yeah even though i'm at the tail end of it there's still a, a decent amount there's still a decent amount of capaldi in my future right capaldi's doctor so I'm, I'm i'm really quite thankful for that so if not anything else at least i'm guaranteed more capaldi in the finale but yeah the finale itself and that whole possibility of him you know potentially speaking of Maisie's character me yeah you know is she going to be a part of it in some capacity, in some manner? Is she going to show up at some point? I think it's probably a good chance of that, right? Um, I mean, she played a massive part here. You know, she played a massive part here in getting the doctor to this point, sending him on that journey. But yeah, the finale is the finale, and I'll get to that. Um, let's kind of get back to the topic at hand, this incredible episode, this masterpiece of an episode, and its place in... Uh, I don't know, the all-time greats, right? So, you know, if I'm looking at just Doctor Who episodes, you know, if you're thinking of some of the all-time greats, and again, uh, it is going to be a bit subjective, even though, of course, a lot of these are many people's favorites of all time. You know, I'm thinking of episodes like um, Blink, The Girl in the Fireplace, um, Turn Left, Midnight, uh, The Waters of Mars, um, perhaps a day of the doctor. I mean, the day of the doctor is this incredible moment, right? It's this momentous occasion, essentially. And it, it, it's just, I don't know, it, it's just this larger than life feeling. But I'm not sure how I exactly rank it as far as incredible episodes, right? I'm thinking of Vincent and the doctor, you know, Silence in the Library and uh, Forest of the Dead. Those types of episodes. Uh, 11th Hour, let's not forget that right? Uh, the Empty Child back in series one. Um, these are the episodes that really jump out at me, right? Um, there's even episodes like uh, The Satan Pit, um, The Impossible Planet, right? That might be a bit more subjective in, in comparison to some of the others I mentioned, but you know, that's, that's, that's a two-parter I really, really enjoyed. There's also Journey's End, The Last Christmas, A Christmas Carol, um, Deep Breath, Right, Capaldi's first proper episode from series eight. Um, so many, you know, this this is this is exciting to me to make uh, my top twenty list essentially. But listen, as I'm saying this, you know, mentally, I was comparing all those episodes again, again. You know, perhaps there there might be a bit of recency bias because I just experienced it and I'm on this incredible high. But this actually might be the best of the lot. It really might be. You know, as I'm going through all of these episodes, and I'm still thinking, you know, as I'm, I'm as I'm speaking, I am thinking of others that that might be similar, but this is just so unique, and that in itself is 
really quite impressive, isn't it? That after such a long time, they are able to put out an episode of this magnitude, an episode this special, this unique, experimental. It really kind of felt like this art house approach, didn't it? You know, I could completely, most definitely picture this episode playing at a film festival. Just this episode. Just by itself. Standalone episode. Right? It, it's damn near an hour long, right? 50, 55 minutes or something. 56 minutes. And speaking of that runtime, yes, I am, you know, I am just so incredibly happy and excited that this was greenlit. That they allowed it. They allowed it the runtime. Because I think it needed that type of pacing. You know, it, it really allows for quite a realistic and subtle approach to the Doctor's grief. The slow burn approach is so crucial to how effective this episode is. In everything it is trying to explore, you need time. You need to give it time. I, I know it might sound a little bit strange or silly, but I, I really truly felt like I'm in there with the Doctor. And right now, I have this urge to go back in there. I have this urge to just kind of put it back on from the beginning, right? You know, uh, I'm really quite excited to put it on the main television um, in the living room, you know, because for 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 YouTube, I, I do have a monitor. I mean, it's 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 quite a nice monitor. Um, it's 32 inch 4K, but still, right? It's different. I do want to pop it in on the main television set, you know, dim the lights and get lost in it truly get lost in it once again you know become that fly on the wall become a part of the the atmosphere itself uh <laughs> you know i know I'm, I'm beginning to sound like a madman but these are my feelings right i just want to get all my feelings out there and i believe that i did mention earlier that this is right up my alley everything about this episode is right up my alley and one of those elements is the slow burn uh long run time and that's not exclusive to film i love the slow burn approach in anything Right? And listen, yes, yes, I know that's not for everyone. You know, I can see how the runtime and the really specific approach of this episode, it might not be for everyone. You know, perhaps it might not be for the casuals. You know, it might not, it might not be for maybe some of the younger uh, audience, right? It, it could be boring for them. You know, I understand that and I, and I accept that. And even for some of the older audience who, who doesn't really care much for this type of approach and more so than anything else they just want a bit of entertainment you know there's that saying you know just turn your brain off and enjoy right there there's stuff like that out there right there there's a lot of stuff like that out there but this episode is not it i feel like this is the type of episode that you really truly have to engage with and i think that really is one of the most impressive things about this episode that it is able to bring you in it is able to get you all caught up in this mystery and the atmosphere the intoxicating atmosphere of it all. And I feel that the cathartic moment of that incredible ending is that much better, that much more um, impactful because of the slow burn approach. It makes it that much more special. And it just makes it that much more triumphant. My goodness, you know, at, at one point, oh, see, listen, I, I'm still at the beginning stages of this because I just thought of Murray Gold. Wow. Wow, I've, 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 I've experienced this man's work for a long time, yet somehow he manages to give me something so unique in this episode. Once again, really quite experimental. The incredible score itself plays a big part, a major part in this episode. It is the absolute pinnacle. It is the sum of every single department being at its peak. The score, the photography, the color grading, the editing, incredible editing in this one. Um, the the foley, the foley work. I mean, it's a one hander masterclass. You know, just as you think that you've seen the best of Capaldi, that you've seen this man at his peak as the Doctor, that you know this is his moment. This is his crucial moment as the Doctor, the moment that's always going to stand out. The man goes and does this. The man goes and gives me this. And you know, like I mentioned earlier, I still have Capaldi for uh, for some time yet. So I might get some more of these incredible performances. How about the phenomenal set design, the production design? Uh, and then of course, you know, beyond that, clearly it's on location as well. I mean, there's some beautiful on-location interiors 
that they've used here. My goodness, I have to look those up. Hell, if it's actually possible to go to one of these locations, I'll do it, right? If I happen to be in that area, if I'm traveling, you know, I'll make a note of it. Most definitely, right? If it, if it is something people, you know, uh, I suppose the public can go to. And the setting as a whole, right? It being staged inside of that castle. Um, you know, the CGI is actually really quite impressive in this one. The special effects are really quite top-notch, aren't they? And then, of course, the writing and directing. Moffat and Rachel. It's just incredible stuff. And I do remember Rachel's name popping up as the director in the two-part finale last series, right? Uh, again, you know, uh, my point stands. The first part of that two-part finale is the one that stood out the most, uh, to me at least. You know, but going back to Murray Gold's score, his unique approach uh, stylistically for this episode, there's a lot of cosmic horror, right? There's synth even. His score absolutely elevates uh, all of these scenes and makes them that much more impactful. I mean, you know, I mentioned a few of these more experimental takes, but then there is a more recognizable approach by Murray Gold in that incredible, incredible montage right at the end. It's, it's essentially one of the best scenes of all of Doctor Who or in all of Doctor Who. His score is so crucial, so crucial to this scene. The buildup. It's building and it's building as I see this incredible selection of scenes repeating, right? Hand selected clearly. Um, you know, that 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 is something I am going to go back to, right? Slow it down and go through all of those scenes and really, really have a look at uh, the specific scenes that they, they, they chose for this. Of course, it's repeating. That's the whole point of it. But still, I think, you know, there is a method to the madness, I believe. And of course, I'll come back to the actual scene itself, but you know, focusing on the music itself as it builds and it builds towards that moment as it crescendos. I mean, it is spine tingling stuff, goosebumps all over the place, chills. And you know, the thing is, Murray Gold's music has done that for me so many times, so many times over the years, um, you know, throughout these episodes. But here, once again, you know, it happens. It happens. I am just covered in goosebumps. I could not help myself but to really engage with the music. I mean, that scene is one of the greatest scenes in all of Doctor Who, isn't it? Right? It's an episode that is full of these incredible moments. Now, let me kind of shift the focus back to the photography, the cinematography. I actually do think this might be the most visually striking episode of the, the show altogether. It is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I mean, just right now, I can think of a dozen shots, a dozen shots that could easily be um, some of the best in all of Doctor Who. And then, of course, beyond being visually striking, there is some incredible visual storytelling. I mean, as you saw, I found myself gasping on multiple occasions at the sight, at the incredible sights of this episode. You know, cinematography has always been one of my favorite aspects of filmmaking. It was one of the first few elements of um, filmmaking or storytelling in this in, in this type of medium that really, really had a hold on me, right? The, the film look specifically really, really had me. And you know, the thing that really makes me sad at this moment is that there is no 4K release for this. I'm pretty sure. You know, I'll have to double check, but I'm pretty sure there's no 4K release uh, for Doctor Who. Um... Maybe not even for the day of the doctor. Actually, maybe there is a 4K release for that. Possibly. You know, because essentially it's not really shot in that format anyways, I believe. But there's so many incredible shots in this one that really truly capture the doctor's um, isolation, his loneliness, his despair, his grief, right? Of course, the writing itself captures a lot of that. The acting as well. The directing but here, you know, through the photography, you see another element that is able to really quite effectively capture. You know, there's that saying, every frame of painting, that is so applicable to this episode. Like I said, you know, just at a moment's notice, I can think of at least a dozen frames that are just uh, beautiful, absolutely stunning, and just full of rich visual storytelling. You know, there's, there's so many moments in this episode that I would legitimately just hang on the wall. Hell, I might even do it. I mean, there's a lot of scenes here uh, and, you know, some of the photography specifically and the lighting choices that really kind of reminded me of Nosferatu. Like I said earlier, there's just a lot of fantastic experimental stuff going on in this episode. 
you know, th- perhaps the inspiration it takes, uh, given the fact that it is staged inside of that uh, castle. And the creature itself actually feels like a representation of many things, right? Of course, death is one of the first few things that came to mind. It functions as the ever constant grief that the doctor is experiencing. And then, of course, you know, that aspect of it, death, that goes back to the opening monologue, right? Uh, and, you know, the opening is fantastic. It truly just sets the stage nicely. And the thing is, it essentially is in the middle of one of the cycles, one of the energy loops. And then, of course, much later it became clear, indeed, that was the Doctor. And I was in the middle of one of those loops being reset. You know, one of the Doctors is, you know, in his last stages. And then it's about to be the rebirth, right? The death and the rebirth in that cycle. Yeah, you know, at that point, it's already 7,000 years because of the placement of the stars, right? Of course, the doctor at that point didn't know. Um, you know, at that point, he, he thought maybe he time traveled. But then he also refutes that almost immediately because he said, I can smell time travel. This is something else. So by the time us, the audience kind of joins in, it's already been 7,000 years in this cycle, in this energy loop. And, you know, the thing is, that actually reminded me of um, episode one, series one, episode one, Rose. Wasn't there that guy, the conspiracy theorist, um, who who mentioned something about uh, the doctor's one constant companion being death or that it is death? Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. You know, recently, I've really had the urge to go all the way back to the beginning of the series. Ooh, that reminds me, there's actually a new set, a Blu-ray set. That's coming out for the 60th anniversary, right? Uh, I believe series one to four are upscaled. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be double dipping. I'll be tapping into that. Um, you know, I think there's there's going to be a box set, the whole thing, um, including Jody's run as well, the most recent. So yeah, you know, I'm I might have to double dip. I might have to double dip. I don't know uh, because I do have all of them. Up until this point, up until series nine, I'll have all this, all of them on Blu-ray. Um, you know, I can justify double dipping for the upscales of series one to four, but I'll have to see. I'll have to see if I if I want to do it for the rest as well. But I feel like I might have to get the whole box set if I if I do want uh, just the upscales for series one to four because I'm not sure if they sell them separately or if they are going to sell them separately. But yeah, sticking to the opening of the episode. Yeah, you know, as he exits that tube. Right. Um, you know, there's that declaration, isn't there? You know, he's angry and he's ready to just blame and have a go at whomever he encounters in here. Though, of course, he does know that it wasn't some specific malicious enemy that killed Clara. You know, Clara thought that she could trick death. But as the doctor stated in that last episode, I'm not as breakable as you. And even in this episode, there's that moment, right? As um, he's kind of asking Clara that, you know, that the construct that's a part of his mind palace. Clara is a part of that because he has internalized Clara, right? Um, and, you know, I suppose instead of him just kind of speaking to himself, it gives um, Capaldi, it gives the doctor someone to just speak to. Just someone to speak at or so, someone to bounce his ideas off of, right? Even though, of course, it's just a figment. Um, but yeah, you know, there, uh, at one point he's like, oh, uh, you know, what would you do, Clara? And then I think, I think the reply or the response is same as you, of course, on the chalkboard. And then, you know, the doctor said something like, oh, that's one of the reasons you ended up dying. That's what killed you at the end or in the end, you know, being like me, thinking like me, trying to channel me. But once I do get that opening and he exits that teleport room, it then kind of sets into motion this incredible exploration of death and rebirth, grief and that constant cycle, the, the, the cycle, that never-ending cycle, something you do have to tackle day by day, even if everything begins to feel the same, if the days begin to feel the same. The idea of giving up in the face of insurmountable grief, why can't I give up just this once? Those moments of Capaldi really feeling that and saying that to Clara, You know, I can see this being an episode that might have a really, really special and personal place in people's hearts, given their own unique situations, or maybe just based around the time they might have actually watched this, uh, that time in their life. Perhaps people that are dealing with or have dealt with a lot of similar issues, you know, their own grief and loss. Even if you look at the tone of the episode, 
right? For the majority of the runtime, it's really quite bleak. Um, it's just unforgiving. Unforgiving. It's de- it's it's really quite depressing, and you know that repetitive nature of you know being in a depression or having depression, uh, rather. Yeah, it's all just so authentic, isn't it? You know, all of us have been there. All of us know that feeling. Every day just feels the same, right? You feel like you're just kind of stuck in a loop. Um, You just kind of start questioning things. What exactly is my purpose anymore? Right? All of us have been there. All of us have been there, right? Um, You know, some have been a bit more luckier than others, you know, just like the doctor said in this episode, why can't I lose just this once? It, it'd be so easy. And of course, even in that statement, you can read quite a bit, right? You know, he goes on to talk about um, that notion of, you know, burning his older self to create a new one. How much longer can I continue? Right. Of course, that kind of doubles as uh, the regeneration process as well. And it does give you some fascinating insight on how the doctor really looks at regeneration or regenerating altogether and just uh, the process of it. And even that, even that, you know, there is this idea of him being able to do that essentially forever. Actually, never mind. I just realized he has limited regenerations, right? I mean, he did. He did until he was gifted more regeneration. In the time of the Doctor, I believe, in uh, Matt Smith's final episode, the thing is, I think, even if I try my best here, and I am trying my best here to cover as much as I can, I feel like this is the type of episode that you can kind of go back to twice, three times, four times, five times, and you'll get something new every single time. You'll get a new perspective every single time. Maybe you come back to it at a different point in life. Maybe I come back to this a year from now, five months from now, and a certain scene or a certain segment of the episode might hit a little bit different. It might mean something a little bit different to me. Seeing Capaldi's character, or sorry, seeing Capaldi's doctor go through it. That's how you know this episode is special, right? It's not just there for pure entertainment. It is trying to do something. It is trying to say something. It is trying to connect with the audience. It is art. This is true art, I believe. It feels like you should be showing this in a film festival. People should be seeing this. People, you know, beyond Doctor Who fans. Of course, you know, you stage it a bit earlier, Right? You get someone up there on a mic and you kind of talk about it and you say, okay, you know, you kind of give them the cliff notes, the spark notes, right? This is the doctor immediately after losing someone he really loved and cared for. So you set it up nicely and you let people know this is the immediate aftermath and this is how he deals with it. And it's all by design, of course, right? Moffat wrote this. He wrote this for a reason. He knew the type of episode he wants to deliver here, the type of message he is trying to deliver Right, the type of connection he's trying to make. And it's not just in the writing. You can just see the episode as a whole. It is meant to be a premium, I don't know, standout episode. Everything about it feels like it's okay. You know, they're, they are going all out. That they are giving it a lot of attention. They are treating it as if it is something quite special. You just see it in the final product, right? It really does differ from a lot of Doctor Who episodes. And I think everything about it is pitch perfect. Moffat just truly delivered. I mean, I think it's a beautifully portrayed battling of grief, um, of loss and fear that essentially has this triumphant conclusion, incredible conclusion, cathartic moment. And once again, I do have to go back to Peter Capaldi and his role in kind of delivering that, in, in kind of connecting with the audience, right? Because in Peter Capaldi, a lot of us can recognize those moments, those feelings, the anguish, the fear, you know, the unbridled rage and determination. Let's shift the focus a bit to the the staging, the setting itself. Um, you know, the thing I love about this is that it feels really quite, I don't know, intimate yet so epic, claustrophobic yet so grand. Um, the castle itself, the rooms, the incredible sights of the castle. Uh, the the actual setting itself as well. A moment that just left me absolutely stunned is of him in that great hall, having a meal, having a meal by himself, just completely isolated, alone, um, just really quite confused about everything, um, lost in his grief, 
you know, that shot, the wide shot of it, uh, of him just appearing in the middle of the frame, almost as a tiny speck, right? Before, of course, you know, the incredible dolly zoom kicks in and takes me right up to Capaldi as he comes to realize, how long am I going to have to do this, right? And then, of course, you know, there's that close-up. Um, it transitions to that close-up of the spoon dropping. But before that, again, there's that silhouette shot of Capaldi. Uh, it's almost kind of like his profile, isn't it? It is. Oh, my God. It's, it's so incredibly beautiful. But one of the more fascinating elements of this episode is, again, the reset that happens every single time. He confesses. Now, in terms of that reset happening and the creature stopping um, from, I don't know, killing the doctor, I suppose, um, I guess it changes a bit because the first time I see it, he confesses that, oh, I'm just realizing right now that I'm actually afraid of dying, right? I mean, the thing is, it was a shocking moment for me as well to hear that. You know, it's, it's a big moment to hear the doctor say that, right? It is quite the confession, isn't it? Uh, it's quite impactful. And then, of course, I see that immediately the creature stops. But, you know, he didn't just, or he, sorry, it didn't just stop. It froze in time, even the flies around it. And again, you know, that's another major constant, isn't it? The flies, uh, again, you know, a constant reminder of death as well, or association with death. Um, yeah, so it froze the first time, but in all the subsequent encounters, it didn't freeze. It just kind of stopped and then it backed off, didn't it? Um, so I don't know. Maybe you can let me know uh, the reasoning behind that. If that's just, I don't know, a stylistic choice that it froze in time that one time. And then, of course, the idea of the reset played a major part as well, right? On many different levels. Like I said earlier, you know, that, that constant cycle, that day-to-day -day cycle, the never-ending cycle of being stuck uh, with your grief. You know, every single cycle or every single energy loop has that breakdown. It has all that self-pity, self-loathing, right? Coming this close to giving up, you know, wanting to give up, um, feeling that, you know, you have no reason to continue, to then finding the strength and solace he required to face the next death, right? And of course, Clara continues to play a part in all of that, right? There's a beautiful moment um, because for the first time and only time in this episode, I get to see Clara make an appearance. Yes, it's not Clara, Clara. It's a construct in his mind palace, but that's how much she means to him, right? It's almost as if he internalized her as all the best parts of her, as a reminder inside of his mind palace. And she keeps him asking questions. She keeps him fighting. And I feel that even though much of it is about him dealing with the loss of Clara and you know his grief um, that follows, I think there's even this element of penance as well, uh, if you look at it from the doctor's perspective, or how he must be looking at it as well, right? Penance for allowing Clara to die. Of course, there's got to be this insurmountable amount of guilt. You know, you see in the prior episode that he blames himself almost immediately, that he he should have noticed, that he should have stepped in, uh, that, she, that she shouldn't have to ask, um, you know, for him to look out for her. And I feel that you really kind of get to see this because Capaldi just expertly moves through a vast emotional spectrum. And honestly, I feel like this episode only works with Peter Capaldi. I mean, clearly Moffat wrote this for Capaldi. Of course he wrote this for Capaldi, right? He's a doctor at the time. But I cannot see how this specific episode could work, uh, you know, with Eccleston or Tennant or Matt Smith. You know, all fantastic actors in their own right. Of course, Tennant and Smith are incredible. And I just really haven't seen enough of Eccleston beyond um, the first series of Doctor Who. But I do know he is in The Leftovers. And that's one of the shows that's really high up on my list. So it'll be really quite nice to see Eccleston in something else, right? Years down the line. But yeah, you know, I truly feel that you can only pull this off with Peter Capaldi. So let's kind of look at the principles of the reset itself and just the setting itself. Um, so essentially, you know, the castle, the castle does provide a few things to the doctor. You know, you see that he's eating, right? He's having soup. Um, you know, there's things in that castle, uh, and you can infer quite a bit as well. I suppose, you know, it, it, it's stocked. It's a stocked castle. Maybe not, it maybe doesn't have everything, but maybe it is providing some of the essentials to the doctor. And then of course, scenes like him having that soup 
it's more than enough to kind of let you know, okay, yeah, he's getting some of the the essentials. But then there's the aspect of all the rooms resetting. Um, but then, you know, there's certain things that do not reset, right? Let, let me see. Okay, let me try to tackle this. Um, the portrait of Clara, it, it does not reset because you see that it's aged quite a bit. Right, the doctor. It's one of the major clues that the doctor has earlier on, that you know this painting has been here for a long time. And of course, by the time the doctor I get to see on screen for the first time come across it, it's been seven thousand years. Right, that cycle is seven thousand years in. Um, so that painting has been hanging there for seven thousand years. Right, it's a beautiful painting of the late Clara Jenna Coleman looking um, as incredible as ever. Um, but yeah, you know, there's that fly that keeps flying around the portrait itself. You know, there's something really quite jarring about that. And then, of course, some of the clues that he leaves himself stay intact as well. You know, you see the arrows pointing to the ground, you know, to that really specific section. It's another really incredible shot of the episode. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, I suppose there's the shovel in the hall. Okay, I, I certainly thought of the possibility of him using the shovel to attack that wall, but clearly there must have been a reason he couldn't have done it, right? Maybe maybe he, he was blocked in, maybe he wasn't able to get to it, maybe he wasn't able to get past the creature, something. I'm sure there's something that was stopping him from using the shovel. Um, but yeah, you know, the idea of punching through that wall that is 400 times tougher than Diamond, I believe he said. My God, you know, one of the standout moments in an episode that is full of standout moments, essentially, is the, is of the Doctor finally getting to room 12, that he's essentially guiding himself towards, right? His past iterations are guiding him. Um, and, of course, that confession of him knowing about the hybrid and his, its existence is basically how he gets in there, right? Because at first, it's blocked by a wall. But, you know, him going through that hall and coming across you know, the wall. And then, of course, his immediate thought is that it's the TARDIS. You know, it said home, but ultimately home is Gallifrey, right? But again, interesting that he considers the TARDIS his home, not Gallifrey. Yeah, you know, his relationship with uh, his people, you know, fellow Time Lords and Gallifrey all together, it'll be, it'll be really quite interesting. That is one aspect I am really quite excited about, how exactly he'll be dealing with them and his feelings on them. Um, as well and their feelings on him because you see they put him in there right to get that information out of him um so i suppose um they kind of reworked it a bit didn't they because uh, earlier in the series right in the beginning of the series you had missy explaining that you know it's meant to be um this place that that gives a dying time lord a chance to confess on their deathbed Right, right before they die, something along those lines. I'm loosely kind of remembering um, everything she was uh, trying to tell Clara about it. But here you see that clearly now the function has changed up a bit. Right, They've kind of, again, reworked it to get some information out of the Doctor. Right, The information about the hybrid, um, the identity of the hybrid, essentially. Um, but he does not give it up. He does not give it up. He came close. He came close. Especially, uh, let me kind of go back to my initial point now. Especially once he does come across that wall and then, you know, at that moment, that moment specifically, he remembers. He remembers everything, right? And that's one of those moments he almost wants to give up. He does want to give up. And it is Clara who kind of helps him get out of it, right? <laughs> There's a beautiful line of dialogue, uh, you know, get up off your arse, get up off your ass and win. He's really thinking about the idea of just telling them. It'd be so easy just to tell them and just give up. And the fact that someone like the doctor, someone like the doctor and someone like Peter Capaldi's doctor gets to that point. Yeah, that's yeah, that's powerful because even he gets to that point. Even he thinks it's just not fair. Why can't I just lose this once? Why does it always have to be me? I, I feel like it really grounds him, doesn't it? It really grounds the doctor to see him in this manner, right? Humanizes him, right? Even though he's not human. Right. Uh, though, yeah, you know, there's <laughs> there's a talk of, you know, the hybrid is me and all that. Let's see. Let's see. And then, you know, there's a shot of him just leaning up against the wall. Right. So defeated, so expressionless. You know, it kind of felt like that moment after someone cries for a long time and they just have no more tears left. And they're just this husk. He is just leaned up against that wall like 
this empty husk. And it's a tragic sight. It's a sad sight to see our doctor like that. That it's one of those images that's really stuck in my mind at the moment. And again, like I said, that's the time he remembers everything. And the crazy thing is he's been at it for 7,000 years at that point. And it looks like there wasn't even a dent, <laughs> barely a dent in the wall itself. And then again, I, I guess that kind of plays into that element of him just realizing, oh my God, I've been at it for this long, for that long. And I have so much longer to go an eternity to go still. It would just be so much easier to just quit, just quit altogether. But of course he doesn't, he perseveres and it ends up being one of the most incredible moments. Oh my God. And you know, the scene itself, the, the montage again, I love how, you know, at first uh, it feels like, okay, nothing's really happening. He's not making much progress, but then there's a shift. Something happens. You begin to hear, you begin to hear more of that story about the bird, right? The bird that he can really quite relate to. And then as the loops play out, I get to hear more and more of the story. And it's just this incredible feeling. It's such a fulfilling feeling. But you know, in terms of the mind palace, I kind of had a thought about it. It kind of explains those moments I had earlier in the series, right? You know, moments of the doctor speaking to the camera, explaining things to the camera, right? Um, yeah, I, I suppose this explains it quite nicely, doesn't it? He's inside of his mind palace in those moments. Um, you know, in one of those, I think it's before the flood, the, the yeah, the second part of that two-parter. Um, he's explaining the rules of the bootstrap paradox, right? And there's one even before that one. I think, ah, sorry, I cannot remember at the moment, but I know there is one. There's another one. But him telling Clara or asking the question of Clara, how long can I keep doing this, right? Burning the old me to make a new one. Again, there is that regeneration analogy in there. Um, but also beyond that, you know, you can look at it from so many different angles. Right? How long can I continue this life of mine? How long can I go through the cycle of you know, making friends, getting close to these people, and then losing my friends, losing these loved ones or the people I love? And then also kind of reminding me of his first proper episode, Deep Breath, Series 8, Episode 1, right? The broom analogy. But yeah, ultimately, I think it presents the doctor at his most broken, right? at his most defiant, at his most resilient, at his most brilliant. I mean, the amount of strategic thinking that's on display is incredible. You know, it was beginning to feel like Sherlock Holmes. And I believe Moffat does write that show as well, right? And I think a lot of the elements of this episode are quite reminiscent of Sherlock Holmes. You know, I've seen the first few. I think I've seen most of the seasons of that show, actually. I think it's just the most recent one that I haven't seen yet. It is a meticulously constructed episode, right? Like I said, every single department excels and it's at its peak, you know, and it feels like an episode that is something to savor. You know, like a good novel that you, you kind of want to live in and feel. And I do feel that ultimately the power of this episode lies in its exploration of these themes. This seemingly infinite loop of grief, uh, the mourning, the struggle for authenticity, possibly confronting your own potential death, right? Really kind of exploring the idea of that. And, and also, I think it really just gives the doctor proper time and space to mourn, to grieve, about his lost friend. But yeah, I think that should do it for this one, for now at least. You know, I can see myself coming back to this episode at some point and maybe, you know, wanted to talk about it again, right? Because I'm sure there's just so much more I can get out of this at different points in life. But yeah, it's an absolute masterpiece and it feels incredible that I got to experience it, right? Also kind of sad that I'm never going to get to experience it for the first time ever again uh, and that I'm probably not going to get this type of episode ever again, right? Um, unless of course there is something incredible in series 10 as well. And listen, of course, I've heard some of the things about Jody's run. Um, it, I mean the writing specifically, because I don't think people hate Jody or anything or her portrayal. Um, I don't know. But the thing I've heard most about the recent seasons or Jody's run is the writing aspect of it. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I'm really expecting this type of episode out of that run. But, you know, there's another one on the horizon. There's a new doctor on the horizon. And also before that, you have the, the specials, you know, the 60th is coming up. So, yeah, you know, actually, you'll have to let me know if I am able to watch those, um, you know, without having watched um, Jodie's run. Because say, even if I do watch it, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get through her run in time for the 60th. I believe it's in December or November. So that's coming up. Uh, yeah, so you know, let me know. Let me know. I do know that Tennant is back, of course. That's impossible to ignore. I know Donna Noble's back. 
um, all of these things are just completely impossible to ignore. You know, it's all over social media. Uh, but yeah, you know, do let me know if I am able to kind of check those out to watch those because of course I would love to watch the 60th anniversary. I'm sure it promises to be really quite special. But yeah, if you enjoyed this, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. I truly want to know your thoughts on the episode and how it, and how it might have affected you personally, right? I'm sure there's some incredible stories um, out there and I'm, I'm, I'm really quite excited to listen to that. If you are interested in full length, and it is timer-based full length, of course, consider checking out the Patreon page. There's also early access. Uh, but yeah, you know, this one, yeah, this one might be the one um, to maybe check out the timer-based full length for. Because I can tell right now I am going to struggle to bring this down to 10 minutes. And I feel like, yeah, it, it might actually butcher it, but that's just how it is, isn't it? You know, um, I think that that was another issue that Day of the Doctor had. You know, if you look at the highlight reel, the 10 minute highlight reel, it's just, I don't know, it, it does kind of butcher the episode, but again, rules are rules. Um, and even those rules are not, you know, set in stone or anything, but it's just these guidelines almost, right? These guidelines that all of us have kind of accepted or kind of just rolled with, right? Um, but yeah, you know, I'll try my best to get in as much of this as possible. But honestly, sitting here, it truly feels like everything, everything is important about this episode. So it'll be a tough edit. I'm sure of it. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me, folks. And thank you for your time because time is precious. It truly is. <laughs> and I do hope to see you again soon for the grand finale. Until then, take it easy.